Trinity Sunday and Father's Day and Colossians. What a combination, but in a sense, a very winning combination. Father's Day, we're celebrating our Heavenly Father too, as all these earthly fathers who are here to testify how wonderful their children have been to them this morning. Last Sunday, we celebrated the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And we're reminded that actually Pentecost is what God does all the time. God the Father, who loves us with an everlasting love, pours out his grace upon his children. And grace is defined as... That's a brilliant, brilliant definition. The one that was given last week was God's unconditional and unmerited love or favour, which I expected you all to shout out, having heard it last week. Jesus, who next week, you will learn, became known as the visible expression of the invisible God, draws us close and fills us with his spirit. One God, three persons, united in one love that has been poured into our hearts. And the passage we're asked to study today in our journey through the letter to the Colossians is a continuation of the wonderfully lyrical prayer with which Paul in prison in Rome begins his letter to the young church at Colossae. I think it's a very fitting passage to, to be looking at on Trinity Sunday because it beautifully illustrates the interconnection of our three in one God. And in this next slide, we see it illustrated in this icon believed to have been created by the Russian painter Andrei Rublev Rublev, in the 15th century. <coughs> Trinity depicts the three angels who visited Abraham at the Oak of Mamre. And if you want to look that up, it's in Genesis 18, verses 1 to 15. But the painting is full of symbolism and is often interpreted as an icon of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Trinity even welcoming us into a circle of love. 600 years ago, to help people understand and come to know God, church ministers used to paint pictures so that people who couldn't read and write could still learn about God. So what do you think we can learn about God from this picture? First thing is that all the three people in the picture have exactly the same circle, the same halo or nimbus around their heads. That's the glow, the glory of God. And you learnt the word for it last week? The Shekinah. Yep, the Shekinah. Somebody was listening. Now these three people are wearing four colours green, brown, blue and gold. And 600 years ago, I'm told that blue was the colour people painted God. It reflected the heavens. So it was God's colour. Three people, all with the circle halos round their identical heads, all wearing blue, the colour of God. So the painter of this picture was saying that these three people are God. They're all holding a long stick, exactly the same length. And if you look at their hands, all three right hands are holding the stick. And if you look at their other hands, all the left hands have two fingers pointing down. What we can see in this is that the painter is saying that these people are the same. Same halos, same blue, the colour for God, same way of holding a staff, in the same right hand, same way of pointing their fingers. Three people who are God, 
people are all exactly the same. Yet as well as being exactly the same, these three people are also different. One person wears green. Green is seen as the colour of spring, the colour of things that grow. The green person represents the Holy Spirit of God who wants us and this church and all church people to be green and grow. One person has brown with a gold stripe. Brown is the colour of soil, the earth. The brown-wearing person represents Jesus who came to earth, put his feet on the ground, felt the dusty soil between his toes. But he has a gold strip over one shoulder. The gold strip signifies kingship. And the other person is wearing an ethereal shimmering gold. That person represents God the Father, a figure at rest within itself. Gold also because of beauty and the God who created a beautiful earth. The painter is using this picture to tell us about God, that God is three persons, Spirit in green to help us grow, Jesus in brown walking on the earth, showing us how to live, the Father in gold who created this beautiful world. Rublev's icon is described as a masterpiece of composition by those who know about these things in the art world. The viewer is being invited to join the meal. The doctrine of the Trinity as a community of love into which the believer is invited to enter is depicted with clarity and simplicity. The icon communicates the idea that the basis of the divine life is hospitality, is welcome, is embrace. As Paul points out in so many places in his letters, God exists in community, in relationship. Three persons, one God. And he provides the model of community of interdependence and love. Love for each other and for God, which cannot be overcome because it's backed by God's everlasting love for each one of us and supported by his everlasting power. We also know about this because Jesus himself told us in John 16, 12 to 15, which you heard earlier read to you. That Jesus needed to leave his spirit to speak into our hearts. Not only what he hears, but he will tell you what's yet to come. He will glorify me, says Jesus, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Do you know I love this passage? Because here I believe Jesus was speaking not just to his friends gathered around him, but perhaps even more so to us across the generations. Think about all the changes that have taken place in our lifetimes, never mind in all the preceding centuries. How could Jesus possibly reveal all those things to his disciples when he walked on earth? Their human minds wouldn't be able to grasp the concepts he would have described. God's spirit continues to guide us into all truth as he continues to make more and more revelations. We are all on a journey through life. And each one of us is unique. And we're all loved by a generous God who loves us exactly the way we are. 
but at the same time delights in our moving forward with all the changes and transformation that movement brings. My beliefs and stages of understanding and faith development continue to change as I live in this constantly changing world, as I study the scriptures, as I listen to other people's stories and gain different insights through my experiences and through discussion with other people of faith. There are many times when I find myself questioning concepts that were inherited from my wonderful parents or things which I've grown up believing because others told me to. I know that I live in a very different world than the one I was born into. God has enabled many scientific truths to be revealed in my lifetime. God gave me a mind to use and he allows me to explore and question because I also know that I can't expect to know everything and there are times when I just have to trust him and sometimes I know that I get things wrong and say or do things that I regret bitterly afterwards but that's part of the learning process too and I've learnt the importance of saying sorry and asking for forgiveness and the importance of giving and receiving forgiveness too. So let's go back to our study passage in Colossians chapter 1. We remember that Paul had never met the community of believers that came together to be the church at Colossae. But in prison in Rome, he had learned about them firsthand from their founder member, Epaphras who had gathered this group of people together and shared his growing faith with them. And Paul had liked what he'd heard about this young church. So in verse 9, Paul repeats the assurance he first made in verse 3 to his readers that ever since he first knew about them, he and his companions have been thanking God for them and holding them in prayer. How important is prayer in our lives? Do we pray continually for folk we've never met, but have heard about? How often do we add a news item to our prayer list? And what do we pray for? And do we let the people that we're praying for know that we're doing so? And do you think it would be an encouragement to them to know Paul certainly felt that it would be. I would suggest that in these five verses, Paul gives us a very good model of a prayer. In verse 9 we read, We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Here he reminds them and us that we all have the opportunity to live spirit-filled lives. And the Holy Spirit will fill as much of our lives as we allow him to. He doesn't push his way in. He waits for that gentle invitation. I'm sure we all long to be filled with the Spirit, but my understanding is that this process is not a once-and-for-all event. But the Greek verb used implies a continuous act of renewal. Because invariably, as fast as we get topped up, we continue to leak. I like to think that there is someone somewhere praying this prayer for me. Wisdom and understanding seem to me to be two very important attributes and coupled together they make a perfect team. Because to truly love, it's no good being just wise without the ability to listen with an open mind and to understand another's point of view. 
and out of understanding. Surely compassion and respect and unity grows. I often think about Jesus' words on the cross, recorded in Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And I wonder if I'd been in his position. Would I have understood enough about the circumstances of that awful situation to be able to plead for forgiveness for everyone involved? Those baying for my blood, those nailing me to a cross, those anxious to possess my clothing, already casting dice for it. How many times have we said or heard said in our current situation something like, they've all been misled, they can't know what they're doing. Moving to verse 10. Good works, we know, are no substitute for faith. But they should be a product of faith. If we are to live a life worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in every way, there are there seemingly impossible lengths of loving we're being asked to go to. If there are, and it may well be so, then to enable us to manage this, we have to allow the fruit of the Holy Spirit to grow in all our lives, making a noticeable difference to our behaviour. As we become increasingly more loving, more joyful, always seeking and promoting peace, patient, kind and generous with everyone, and wholesome in our speech and conduct, always faithful to our promises and gentle with all, even when that demands a lot of self-control to bite our tongue and keep our own tempers under wraps. This is a huge ask and one that we can't possibly do in our own strength. And as we pray and share our experiences with one another, and read our Bibles with the understanding which the Spirit gives, so our knowledge of our amazing God and his plan for our lives broadens and deepens. Verse 11 tells us that it was never going to be easy. Because here, Paul reminds us that will we, we will need to be strengthened with every bit of power available to us. That is God's glorious might. And we need it. Not so that we will win every battle that we're faced with, but rather, Paul tells us, so that we can endure, put up with all the dark times and difficulties we will have to face in our earthly lives. Not just with patience, which is tough enough, but with joyful thanksgiving. Because what we do have to be thankful for all the time, in whatever circumstances, is our adoption into our Heavenly Father's family, where we become co-heirs with Jesus of the amazing kingdom of life and light. Paul finishes his prayer by reminding his readers of the rescue mission Jesus undertook on the cross so that we might have forgiveness of our sins. And that entry into God's eternal kingdom as redeemed beings. When God sent his son into the world to reconcile himself, us to himself, to show us what he is like, and to demonstrate how life should be lived. Jesus spent much of his short ministry on this earth teaching his followers all about relationship. Relationship to God and relationship to one another. And in the process, he upset a lot of people by showing how formalised religion 
can sometimes get hold of the wrong end of the stick and lead people away from God's purposes. He gave us a commandment that we should love one another. And he answered the question, who is my neighbour, by graphically demonstrating that caring for one another and not counting the cost or looking for thanks is what life is all about. Is this the discipleship that Paul was hearing about from the church in Colossae and giving thanks for? And how well do we follow that example? How much do we really want to follow that example? How much cons more concerned are we about making sure that we're all right than caring for our neighbours? Do we pray and take action, for example, about people's homes, schools and lands being destroyed and human rights violated in so many countries, but not least Palestine? About the millions of people currently suffering from the crippling effects of climate change? Or about the effects of benefit cuts on families in the borough of Scarborough? Dutch-born Catholic priest and writer Henri Nguyen has written a lot about prayer and I make no apology for using his words here. Prayer is the beginning and the end, the source and the fruit, the core and the content, the basis and the goal of all peacemaking. When we sit down to pray, we enter the presence of God who disarms our hearts. We make our peace with God, and God gives us the gift of peace. I believe that the practice of daily prayer eventually leads us to stand up publicly against all that goes against God's love, including war, poverty, and nuclear weapons. Because we have come to know God's love for us and for everyone, we are motivated to join that disarming love by standing with the poor and the oppressed and loving our enemies. I also believe that peacemaking can only be a lasting work when we live and work together. Life in community not only strengthens us to work for peace and justice, it makes peace among us and we become a light of peace in our world. And as Paul reminds us, those who are strong in faith must help the weak, not by undermining what little faith they have, but by encouraging, if necessary, by agreeing to disagree and most of all, by praying for one another. Inner peace is an amazing gift of a loving God. At times, we all experience deep sorrow, pain, situations where we don't know how we're going to go on. Our Heavenly Father knows how we feel. And if we're tuned into God, the Holy Spirit within us prays for us when we don't have the words and strengthens us, and comforts us. And Jesus, our friend and redeemer, walks beside us. I'd like to finish by sharing a true story, which for me is a vivid parable of God's ability to see us through whatever difficulty we may face. It's a story from a family holiday at Centre Parks just over 10 years ago and is a story which I know I've told here before, and I make no apologies, because it's vivid in my remembrance. If we could cut to, to slide 19, that's it. The tree trail is a quiet place suspended high above the voices of the on onlookers. We'd climbed higher every time we crossed a swinging bridge, reaching for ropes, balanced on swinging tires, edged across trapezes, 
Once looking down with a thudding heart and aching arms, I'd learnt what dizzy heights meant as the landscape momentarily swirled before my eyes. The latest crossing had been a tough one. A balance beam with a footfall wide flattened upper edge for two thirds of the way, but the rounded bit in the middle section was just round. It spanned the 15 or so foot gap between the trees, but high above the ground. Nothing to hold on to, but the harness rope which looped above me to the wire from which I knew I would dangle ignominiously if I fell. <laughs> Only one thing for it, look straight ahead and walk across the beam. An act of will to keep looking straight ahead and exhilaration as I made it to the platform and turned to see my granddaughter, six-year-old Beth, looking at the beam from the platform I'd just left with wide-eyed horror as my son arrived to join her. No room for manoeuvre, strictly a two-person platform, room for tree-hugging only. Then the anguished whisper, Daddy, I can't do it. There's nothing to hold on to. Just look ahead, Beth, and keep walking. You'll be fine. I can't. Panic rising, volume increasing. Sorry, Beth, I did ask you if I could do this. I want to get down. I don't want to get up to go on. Then tears, raw fear. Beth, Beth, came her father's voice as he squatted beside his frightened child. Listen to me, Beth. Don't cry. Listen, listen. The voice urged and gradually the sobs ceased as she raised her face to meet her dad's gentle eyes. We'll do it together. I'll walk with you. I'll be right behind you. I'll hold you and I won't let you fall. And trusting her dad, they did it together. I believe that sometimes God challenges us to follow paths we fear to take. But he promises to always walk with us and he will never let us down. My prayer is that we will all follow Paul's example and be a people of prayerful encouragement, witnessing continually to the love and power of our triune God. Amen.